Well, thank you. You're going to have to uh, put up with me again this morning. Catherine Britton, our co-chair of the Information Liability Subgroup, could not be with us today. Uh, Chelsea Good has been a, a huge benefit to our working group as we've worked on this uh, issue. Before I get into the, uh, the white paper, <clears throat> which we had hoped would be available for distribution at the conference, but is still going through some edits, uh, primarily just choice of words by attorneys not that familiar with the livestock industry, so there needs to be some touch-up on that so we can avoid confusion. I think that's understandable. Uh, our working group, our subgroup, has also tackled the ADT 14-point document and spent quite a bit of time with that document. Uh, feeder cattle, the addition, the timing of if and when feeder cattle and how those get added uh, to the ADT process or to some type of official traceability process has uh, garnered a lot of discussion as well. But given the limited time today, I wanted to spend uh, spend it on this uh, this white paper, draft white paper. So I've summarized it in a few slides, and I'll do, we'll just walk through those. I don't know if it's wise for a non-attorney to be giving an overview of a legal document, but I promised Chelsea that I would pay her after the conference if she would answer all the difficult questions. Just out of curiosity, how many attorneys besides Chelsea, how many attorneys do we have in the room? Okay, Craig. All right, well, good. We're, the non-attorneys are in the majority. All right, so I, I, uh, our group owes a special thanks because it was pro bono work to Elizabeth Brumley, uh, Rumley and Tiffany Dow Lashman, respectively at the National Ag Law Center and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, uh, the two attorneys that did the bulk of this uh, research and writing. Our working group had several conference calls developing an outline for uh, the two authors to use. We engaged some private sector attorneys that have experience in this area of law and had an interest in it and had conference calls with them as well, further refined the uh, outline, <clears throat> and then turned it over to Beth and Tiffany to uh, generate the document. Primary, the two primary issues, obviously, being issues of confidentiality, and liability, and we talked about that during some of the Q&A yesterday. So starting first with the federally mandated traceability system and the issue of data confidentiality under that, uh, we have the privacy law, which is somewhat of an overarching umbrella on protecting information that individuals share with the government. But as in most legal areas, there are exemptions and exceptions and other carve-outs that, uh, that make it interesting as to how this might all play out uh, in the future. So that addresses, as I noted, the unnecessary exchange of personal information. So then Congress enacted FOIA, or Freedom of Information, and there are exceptions under FOIA as to what you can get access to or the public or activist groups or anyone might get access to as we go forward with an ID and traceability system, database management issues, and uh, protecting that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, protecting producer information. So under FOIA, you can request agency records, but there are exemptions as well to uh, protect those requests. There are statutory exemptions. Interestingly enough, in the 2008 Farm Bill, there was a specific statutory exemption as to information provided by producers about their agricultural operations to USDA. And Congress specifically exempted that information and protected it. It was later challenged. There was a media request by a reporter that wanted access to the, under the NAES, the previous NAES program that we've uh, talked about, uh, during this conference, the uh, National Repository for, uh, for premises, Premise Identification, the NPIR. Uh, USDA denied that request under current statutes, and the uh, courts supported USDA. So as we, as we talked during the Q&A system, or uh, <clears throat> excuse me, process yesterday, there should be uh, quite a bit, there is quite a bit of protection today. Uh, for protecting information, and there may be a need at the federal and state level moving forward to further refine that. Confidentiality issues under state-mandated traceability systems. Uh, there are 
FOIA laws, sunshine laws uh, in every state. They vary considerably. Some are more wide open than others. Uh, the ones that have state-specific protection of animal ID on the books today are Alabama and Georgia. Those are not the only, uh, <coughs> the only uh, states, but those are two uh, primary major cattle-producing states. There is little uniformity, which I don't think would surprise any of you. There's little uniformity that exists among states on sunshine laws, which is dissimilar from an, an example would be the Uniform Commercial Code. If you have any experience with that on liens, agricultural liens, et cetera, there's been a major initiative through over decades across the states to modernize and, and to uh, uh, make similar across the states the UCC. That does not exist in the issue that we're talking about today. <clears throat> Another issue under confidentiality is an industry-led traceability system or private sector database management. Uh, these are not subject to federal or state FOIA laws, uh, but they are subject to private contractual agreements and contract law. Those would be between two or multiple parties, so those are issues that are going to have to be addressed as we move forward. And all of that would be subject to subpoena power. If, it, if there was a dispute or a disagreement that it ended up in court, uh, as the attorneys noted in the paper, you could be uh, subpoenaed. But uh, usually those subpoenas do not lead to the public disclosure of information. That's not always the case, but, um, but it is in a, in a lot of, of instances. Shifting gears from issues of confidentiality to producer liability, which I think that's the bottom line question that a lot of people have is, as we move forward with animal ID and traceability and expand information that we may be sharing amongst ourselves or among state or federal animal health officials, what additional increase in liability occurs? Uh, the authors noted that traceability on its own will not expand producer liability. Those issues have always existed, and we talked about that a little bit, the group did during the Q&A session uh, yesterday. But identification does, up and down the chain, does increase, for lack of a better term, accountability, the term they used, accountability. Uh, and that versus, that's com compared and contrasted to anonymity. I think we talked yesterday during the Q&A session that uh, even though there's not a uh, significantly robust, robust traceability system in the cattle industry today, there are ways to trace back from the retailer to the packing plant, to the feed yard, stocker, cow-calf. It takes time. It takes a lot more time than we would hope in, if we're chasing a disease trace back and trying to stop and shut down animal movement to protect the herd. But in other issues, uh, time may not be quite so sensitive. So trace back, as the authors noted, trace back capabilities exist today. Liabilities are also governed under tort law. Uh, you really start getting in the weeds with the attorneys, and I may need some help, Chelsea, when we get into tort law. But it, three of those main, major areas that you'll see when this paper is released that the authors covered in it are warranty, strict liability, and negligence. And under warranty, you get into the implied warranty of merchantability. So if you're a merchant selling a product, whether it's a widget or an animal, there are some implied warranties that you're selling products to the public that are in good, a good state of condition. They don't have disease. They don't have other, other blemishes. But there are debates within the states and within the courts as to whether or not livestock producers are merchants. So there's a gray area of the law. In fact, in a number of states, livestock producers don't fall under these same legal responsibilities as merchants of other types <clears throat> Excuse me. Apologize for my voice. Uh, merchants of other types of uh, products. Uh, some of the things that are considered are the experience, the degree of business skill. I believe there were four. I didn't list them all, and there's probably a longer list that get into those kind of decisions by the court. The courts are divided on this issue, which is not a surprise. It's very fact-specific, as is a lot, a lot of development of case law, that old uh, adage that bad, bad facts makes bad law or good facts makes good law uh, certainly would be applicable to this. 
just as an example, and I believe this was a Wisconsin case of an E. coli traceback, that in the end, the jury awarded and the judge, the court system supported, and it went all the way to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, if I remember, and the damages were awarded 80% to the packer, 20% to the restaurant. None of these cases to date, at least that I am aware of, uh, and Chelsea, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've identified any cases that have been traced back or, let me say it this way, that liability has passed back to the producer. And as we noted in our Q&A yesterday, feed yards are pretty easy to find beyond that packing plant. Uh, another producer liability is the statutory limitation on warranties that the authors covered and limits on livestock warranties in several states. So again, livestock is separate and treated differently than most other products uh, in when we get into this legal discussion of producer liability or merchant liability. There are express warranty uh, issues that could arise. Those uh, usually are covered by contract law, so I'll let you worry about that uh, between your other business partner and your both of your attorneys, or multiple attorneys, depending upon the size of the debate. And then there are products liability issues that were discussed. Animals are not considered, as I mentioned, products in many states, and the authors go into some uh, detail on that. The other issue under producer liability would be negligence or failure to exercise reasonable care. Reasonable care in the production of a safe and wholesome food product, I think, would be most of what comes to mind first as far as a liability traceback. Uh, most likely an issue for producers. Uh, what a reasonably prudent person would do is the legal test that usually gets <clears throat> put before the court or before the jury. And then a failure to ex exercise reasonable care would be a significant test in a case like this. Again, very fact-specific and usually determined by a jury. So in conclusion, uh, the law surrounding animal traceability system is not entirely clear. It needs further clarification, as we've talked about during Q&A, whether that be on a state level or a federal level. We need to continue as we move forward with building systems be very mindful of confidentiality, data protection, and liability. In fact, if we can't, as we've experienced, I think you all have when we talk about database management, <coughs> if we can't ensure the producers that the data going into these databases is protected, uh, they won't be putting data into those databases. That was made loud and clear to us as we've been establishing our pilot project. And then as we've talked, we need to uh, be mindful of and keep considering the possibility of federal or state changes. So uh, I want to thank again Beth and Tiffany for all the, the time and effort they put into the paper. I hope that it will be available to you uh, through NIAA uh, in a couple of weeks. So thank you.